The exhibition could not have been possible or executed without the assistance of David Tovey and the wonderful team of volunteers that has made it all possible. I'd like to thank them publicly for the fantastic effort in bringing this show together. While here tonight, I hope that you will take the opportunity to not only enjoy the wonderful early paintings that have been brought home to where they were created all those years ago, but also to view the many other diverse and interesting exhibits that the museum has to offer. Please spread the word that St Ives Museum is a great place to visit. We are a volunteer-run organisation celebrating 100 years in St Ives since the creation by our founder, Robert Morton Nance, under the motto, gather up the fragments before they be lost. We rely on our visitor numbers through the door and any voluntary donations that we, that we gratefully receive. To accompany the 2023 exhibition, David has kindly updated his superb book charting the story of the early artist who first visited St Ives, titled The Dawn of the Colony, and that book is on sale here this evening. Please can you now join me in welcoming Mr David Tovey, who will give us an introduction to the work on display and tell us more about the early visiting artists. Mr David Tovey. So what does the exhibition attempt to do? Well, it tells the story um, throughout really the, 18th, uh, the 19th century um, of the town uh, as it transforms itself from a dirty, stinking industrial town um, dominated by mining, fishing and shipbuilding industries into what was hoped to be uh, and what proved to be um, a prosperous tourist uh, and health resort. And if you look at the various images uh, in the show, you'll see uh, features that show that background. You'll see um, paintings showing the harbour full of sailing ships, uh, many of which will have been uh, built in the town. Uh, there are a number of paintings showing uh, the mines, uh, views from the mines and, and the mining <coughs> activity. And obviously there are plenty of paintings showing the extraordinary scenes in the harbour uh, when a huge pilchard catch was caught um, offshore. So, uh, fascinating aspects of the town. Uh, there are also some interesting features of the town that help you to date paintings. And uh, this was quite a, uh, an interesting aspect of the research was that, um, I mean, for instance, I thought <coughs> that the famous Pepperpot Lighthouse on Smeaton's Pier was built in the 1770s when the pier was built. But no, it was actually only built in 1831. <coughs> so if you see an image of Smeaton's Pier with no lighthouse on it, then it predates 1831. Uh, then there's the development of the terrace. Uh, there are a number of images that show very clearly three distinct villas on the terrace. And these were the ones that built uh, during the ownership of Sir Christopher Hawkins in the 1820s. And then there's no further development until the 1840s, uh, when the Fern Lee Terrace end gets built, um, and the, the villas the other side are, are built in the 1850s. So that's a, an interesting dating point. Um, you then have the mine engine house on Pedalma Point which was built in 1860 and for 30 years was a very picturesque uh, feature in the harbourscape, as you can see from uh, a number of these paintings. Uh, you have the wooden pier, uh, which was built, uh, or started to be built in 1864, um, but which was really never finished, and which by the end of the uh, 1870s was breaking up. Um, so we've got a couple of depictions um, in the works of the pier, probably at its greatest extent. Uh, but there's also a depiction by John Moyford, for instance, of the damage caused in the gale in 1881 when half the middle of the pier went. And by the time that the artist settled in the colony um, in 1885, there's very little of the wooden pier left. So you get a fascinating story 
um, of that saga, which was a, a, a very difficult saga for St. Ives to cope with. So uh, if we then look at some of the artists um, that are involved, um, what's particularly interesting are, are some of the foreign artists as well. And there are one or two artists that are not normally associated with St. Ives. So in one of the display cabinets, you'll see an engraving by Humphrey Repton, the famous landscape architect. Now, I don't, I've never heard the name Humphrey Repton mentioned in a St. Ives context before, but in something called Peacock's Polite Repository um, <laughs> of, 80, of 1791, there is a drawing of St. Ives, um, which is a year before his first Cornish landscape scheme. So, you know, it's immensely important uh, on a, uh, a landscape study as well as a St. Ives study. Um, then uh, there's an uh, engraving from 1824 um, based on a sketch by Frederick Stockdale, who uh, produced a book called Excursions Through Cornwall in 1824. Now, I've never heard Stockdale's name mentioned in a St. Ives context, and yet there are three or four engravings over the next 30 or 40 years that, to me, are based <coughs> on that original sketch by Stockdale. So, again, another name that uh, comes into the St. Ives story, which we haven't heard about before. Um, finding sort of professional artists working in St. Ives in the first half of the 19th century is quite difficult, but uh, we do have Edward William Cook, who visited in 1848, and there are a couple of his sketches um, on consecutive days, October the 11th, October the 12th, on what he called Carrick Gladden Cove, which we now know as Carvis Bay. And he shows you that that's a working beach. It's not a pleasure beach, it's a working beach. Um, so uh, that's interesting. Then we get to the uh, 1859, which is a key date um, in Cornish art, because that's when the railway went down to Penzance. And we begin to have some artists coming to visit St. Ives, such as uh, James Clark Hook, uh, and the Bristolians, George Wolfe and Samuel Phillips Jackson. So there's some images from the early 1860s by them. Um, one of the first foreign artists to work uh, in St. Ives was a Belgian artist called Henri Durand Braga. Again, not a name I've ever heard mentioned in a St. Ives context before. Uh, but he came across with a French delegation to look into Cornish mining. And uh, you'll find on one of the panels his view from Will uh, Marjorie uh, overlooking the town. In, in, in a display cabinet, there's uh, his depiction of a couple of Cornish miners from Will Marjorie as well. So a very interesting international name uh, we haven't heard about before. 1870s, um, well, uh, there's a number of artists uh, represented, but I'll just pick out um, Theodore Weber, a German artist who paints the wooden pier in the late 1870s. So, uh, with, you know, St. Ives becomes known as an international community, and yet we have these foreign artists who are working um, in the town before the colony was actually formed. And then, one of the most important figures in Cornish art, although we don't recognise this in Cornwall because all his paintings are in American um, public galleries, is William Tross Richards, who was hailed as America's leading pre-Raphaelite marine artist. <laughs> so that's, you know, he painted his coastal scenes in incredible detail. Now, he came down to Cornwall when he first came to England in 1878 and found a new subject that he sold immeasurably in, in uh, America. And there's this wonderful watercolour by him um, of both pilcher boats and mackerel boats um, on the Harbour Beach with the Pandolva Mine in the Bratka. Um, so he uh, developed what he called his grand style of watercolour painting while based in England, while um, studying Turner. And he, uh, in the winter months, um, stayed with George Henry Borton, who is one of the few artists who was a member of both of the National Academy of New York and of the Royal Academy, hugely 
important figure in Victorian art. And so clearly Bolton came down to St. Ives in 1881 because he was recommended by uh, Tross Richards. And so we have this amazing painting of boys wrestling, Cornish wrestling, um, which was uh, exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1882. And th this is a sort of Victorian sentimental painting. It it's highlighting the rural <coughs> idyll of St. Ives Bay. Um, so it's the sort of painting that actually all the initial set laws were reacting against, but it's fascinating that we've got it as an example of the sort of painting um, that they were trying to move away from. Then in 1883, there is the Alberto Ludovici Jr. painting of the fish sale. Now, he came down to St. Ives in 1883 because his father was the treasurer of the Society of British Artists and in the winter exhibition of 1882 there had been seven paintings of St. Ives by Edwin Ellis. So this is how the news spreads. They see a painting of a town that they like or a scene that they like as an exhibition and the next crop of artists come down. So Ludovici's painting of a fish sale dates from 1883. The most famous painting of a Cornish fish sale is Stanhope Forbes from 1884. So, you know, we beat him um, uh, by having a, a, a painting of, of a very attractive fish sale um, from, from a year earlier. Um, and by then, one's getting really a large number of artists coming down. There's a couple of William Bartlett paintings. Uh, he was a regular visitor from 1883 um, throughout the 1880s and wrote a, a seminal article about his time in St. Ives for the Art Journal in 1897. So um, we now come up to the formation of the colony. Um, William Eady was one of the initial artists and he's represented in, in the show. Um, and the this colony gets founded in the winter of 1885, but it's the influx of Americans in 1886, which is an absolutely crucial factor. And one of those Americans, Howard Russell Butler, who's, who's represented in the show, said that the person who really discovered St. Ives was the Frenchman, Emile Louis Vernier. Now, um, that's an extraordinary statement. Uh, obviously, many artists have painted in St. Ives before that. But what I think he means is that Vernier was a regular in Concarneau. Um, and he um, obviously told the artists in Concarneau about the attractions of St. Ives. And that's what led the initial group of artists who all had Concarneau connections to come to St. Ives in 1885 to 1887. And Vernier, extraordinary, one of, the, one of the prize finds I've made was that there is an auction catalogue of a sale of Vernier's work in February 1886 in Paris. And of the 92 paintings in that auction, 44 were of St. Ives. So that shows you uh, how much uh, he had been painting um, in St. Ives. So maybe he really was the person who not discovered St. Ives, but set the St. Ives colony on this international course, which resulted uh, with all these international artists flocking to the town from um, 1886 onwards. So by the time we get to 1890, when this exhibition comes to an end, we really have a colony that's flourishing. All these foreign artists are exhibiting at the Paris Salon. They're winning medals at the Paris Salon. Um, and the groups of artists are so big in St. Ives now that we have a, a that the St. Ives <coughs> Arts Club is full. The colony was on its way. Um, so I'd just like to reiterate what Andy Smith said uh, about the astonishing work that uh, the volunteers have done over the winter. Uh, I can't tell you the hours that they have spent in transforming uh, the museum so as to be able to take these paintings uh, and to hang them 
uh, in this way. Um, and I just only hope that all that effort proves worthwhile and that the tourists flock to the museum uh, this year. Thanks very much. Thank you.